good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, being here uh, for this exciting uh, presentation. I uh, look forward to it. Uh, my role here is to introduce the department head, who will then uh, introduce the, uh, the speaker. Uh, so my name is uh, Annemiek Vernost. I'm the Associate Dean of Research of the Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences. So Derek Bruin, uh, who's standing right there, uh, is a professor and head of the Department of Agribusiness and Agricultural Economics at the University of Manitoba. His uh, recent research focuses on grain and oil seed markets, including grain transportation policy. He was raised on a mixed irrigation farm in Purple Spring, Alberta, and then he discovered Manitoba, which is a much better place to live. And uh, more importantly, when he was living in Alberta, many of his neighbors were of Dutch origin. So, uh, <laughs> So he, uh, he was raised around very, very friendly people. Uh, Derek is a past president of the Canadian Agricultural Economic Society and is the current director of the Farm Management Canada. So with that, please Thank welcome you. Derek. Okay, uh, I'm going to share introduction duties with uh, Dr. Barry Prentice. Uh, on behalf of uh, Agribusiness and Ag Economics, I certainly want to thank the speaker for coming, and will, I'm looking forward to hear what you have to say about the protein um, supply chain. Your trip here was sponsored in part by the Solomon Sinclair uh, Institute for Farm Management, and I think it is good farm management to understand what happens past the farm gate, and there's lots of that in, uh, in the work by uh, Dr. Charlebois. Uh, I also wanted to uh, say that the trip was also partially funded by the uh, Transportation, or sorry, the Transport in Institute at the Department of Supply Chain Management, uh, uh, and that was to come to attend the Fields on Wheels conference tomorrow. The Fields on Wheels conference is a conference that looks at the entire supply chain from field to final consumer. It has been the brainchild of Dr. Barry Prentice since he was in the, in the business department, is that right? <laughs> when he was very, very young. 20, so this is the 24th Fields on Wheels conference tomorrow. And uh, Barry's been involved in that for a long time. He's a long time researcher on the economics of grain movement and the entire supply chain. Uh, and uh, I've welcomed working with him on this conference. I've learned a lot about railways working with him. And someday, if you want to have a long conversation, about uh, transportation, asking about moving by air. <laughs> <laughs> so please welcome Dr. Barry Prentice. Thank you very much, Derek. And uh, we'll talk about that air mode later air sure. on this one. Sure. Uh, I very much appreciate you all coming, and also the uh, partnership with the Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences. Uh, with the Asper School of Business. I, I think we too often live in our own silos and we don't get enough joint things together. And, and this talk, of course, spans the two very nicely, so it was very appropriate. And of course, it's also nice to come and speak here because the, the Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences always has good coffee and cookies, I know, <laughs> at your uh, seminars. So there's an extra bonus to, to come here. And uh, the other sponsor in this is the Stu Clark uh, uh, speaker series, uh, which is also funding this. So it takes a village to raise a child, and I guess it takes a, a bunch of us to actually get a, a keynote speaker to come with the caliber of Dr. Charlebois, who I'd like now to introduce. Uh, Dr. Charlebois is a professor of uh, food distribution and policy at Dalhousie University, and is also the scientific director of the Agri-Food Analytics Lab, uh, located at Dalhousie as well. He's a former dean of uh, Faculty of Management at Dalhousie, but before joining Dalhousie, he was affiliated with the University of Guelph for some seven years, yeah. and uh, also founded or co-founded the RL uh, Food Institute uh, there, and was the Associate Dean in the College of Agribusiness and Economics. And before that, he was a prairie boy for a while uh, working at the University of Regina, so he also has some Western roots. Uh, sometimes known as the food professor, he has uh, current issues in a broad area of food distribution, security, safety, and traceability, one of my interests as well. Uh, one of the most cited scholars in the, the food chain management area, 
and value chains and traceability. He co-authored uh, some uh, four books, five books, and the latest one was published in 2017. Uh, I can give you this information later, but I will tell you he's also widely published in academic journals and appears in the media a great deal with the likes of New York Times, Boston Globe, Wall Street Journal, The Economist, and those who read the free press still, I see him regularly in a column in the free press, so uh, very widely uh, discussing aspects of, of food and transport uh, distribution that goes with that as well. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Charlevoix, please come and uh, talk to us about fake food, I guess. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, it, is, it is my fourth trip to Manitoba this year, so 2019 is my year, I guess. Uh, I was actually in Brandon in January at minus 35, uh, talking to cattle producers. That, my year started with cattle in Manitoba, talking about the great protein crisis. And now I'm here before you on Halloween Day. Um, tomorrow is World Vegan Day, by the way. Did you guys know that? Yeah, World Vegan Day. And so there's lots of discussion about proteins in general. And people are trying to figure out what's happening. What's, what's the future of proteins? Are, are we seeing the, uh, the end of beef? Is beef dead? Well, beef is dead. It's just the sector itself. The sector itself is it really going to suffer as a result of of seeing a, a massive number of consumers looking at different options? So this afternoon, I want I want to talk to you about uh, obviously what's happening in the marketplace. I want to talk to you about some strategies that I've seen. I'll also talk about the research backing up some of the claims or perhaps false claims coming from different interest groups, uh, companies as well, and, uh, and hopefully we'll have some time for a discussion. Do we have a clicker or I just go the old fashioned way? Oh, by the way, Mr. Camera, get used to it. I move around a lot, so, but I'll stay right here. I won't walk in the, uh, in the aisles. So this is, this is, as you probably would have uh, guessed, it is the first page of Beyond Meat's website. Who has heard of the company Beyond Meat? You are not living under a rock. Uh, Beyond Meat is now a well-known company. It's 11 years old. It's hardly a startup, really. But we started to hear about Beyond Meat only a couple of, week, a couple of years ago. But since day one, since 2008, when the company started, it's been infatuated with this concept of replicating beef. What beef does in your mouth, what beef does on your grill, everything. On your website, on their website, it shows better. That's why I circled the word better. Better than beef more sustainable than beef. It's better for your health. That's what we've been hearing a lot. Is it true though? Is it factually true? This research actually backed these claims up. And I would argue right now the market is absolutely confused because really we've seen studies suggesting this, we've seen studies suggesting that, have you guys heard recently about this uh, red meat consumption study telling everyone that red meat is actually good for you? You guys hear about that? Well, the first author is a friend of mine, Brad Johnson from Dalhousie. And my goodness, we had coffee last week together, and he got the nastiest emails. Go on Facebook, you'll see terms like planet killer, you'll see uh, s horrible names thrown at Brad. It was, it was really, really sad to, to, to watch. There's a lot of nastiness going on, and, and, and this nastiness, I think, comes from this fascination of comparing one with the other. Well, in, in actuality, I actually don't think they're the same kind of products. Beef is beef. 
It's natural, unprocessed. On the other hand, you have Beyond Meat, 27 ingredients, lots of sodium, you know? And of course, I met, I had the pleasure to meet the CIO of Beyond Meat in New Orleans in, at the IFT in June, with the, which is the International Food Technology Show. And he was telling me, you know, Sylvain, yes, we know, it's processed, not that healthy, we get it. They're changing the formula. They're actually making the product healthier. That's great. But it's going to take a while. But right now, I would say that we are dealing with a highly confused marketplace. And when it comes to, when it comes to proteins, people don't know what to do. But they are concerned about a couple of things. The environment, climate change. Hurricane Greta was in Canada. I think she's still in Canada, isn't she? Yeah. Greta Thunberg, 16-year-old, going around the world, <laughs> telling, preaching about this climate crisis. And it doesn't matter where you stand on climate change. The climate is changing. Okay? And consumers, all of us, feel more empowered, I would say, to make a difference. If you are going to work in a car in Winnipeg, it's because you probably need a car to go to work. And that's probably not going to change anytime soon because it gets cold. But how about breakfast? How about lunch? How about dinner? Why not if, if, I, if I can make a difference and I see the planet on my plate, Maybe, maybe, perhaps I could do something for the planet and reduce the amount of meat I consume. Maybe. So, and that's why there's a lot of discussions around proteins. Animal welfare is another one creeping up. I met, I met farmers. I've been meeting farmers for 20 years. I grew up on a dairy farm. Farmers said for 20 years, let's advocate. Let's actually educate the public about what we do. And they'll understand that what we do is difficult. It's, a hard, it's hard work. And of course it's hard work. Of course it's difficult. But I think what's starting to happen is that more and more people are starting not to like what may happen on farms. You know, I, I grew up on a dairy farm. Impregnating a dairy cow is part of the process. Taking away a calf from the mom Milking a cow for 10, 15 years, then go to the slaughterhouse, that's what we did. But when you start talking about that to an urban person who's never been on a farm, all of a sudden you see in their eyes, wow, is this right? You know, is this what we should be doing? And so that also is a fact. And health is another one. Health, which goes back to my... Buddy Brad's study about red meat consumption, who actually has read the report that came out a couple of weeks ago about red meat consumption being good for you? Oh, you didn't? Let me give you a 15 second synopsis, okay? You don't have to read, you can read if you want, but here's what I got from Brad's research. So he got together with 13 other scholars from around the world looked at, it was a meta-analysis of 54 studies. And so he looked at all 54 studies only to say that for many of the studies suggesting that processed meats causes cancer or red meat consumption is bad for you, findings were often overly generalized. And most of these studies went with associations versus causation. And so, of course, with media, any media in the room here? They weren't invited? Great, we can be honest. <laughs> so, looking at generalization really brings media to enforce a different sort of narrative. And that's what's been happening for the last five, six years. This overpowering narrative to go against meat has really caught industry consumers, everyone off guard. So 
This is why I think the study that Brad came out a couple of weeks ago really points to how um, really reckless we have been as a society to interpret data, to interpret research in, in general. And that's, that's a sad state of affairs, and I'm very concerned about that. Confusion. We, this summer, our lab, we asked Canadians, so what uh, factors Canadians feel have largest negative effect on the environment? Look at animal agriculture. We did ask Canadians, what is the most important factor when it comes to the environment in, in, uh, in the economy? 7% of Canadians right now believe that animal production is the worst menace for, envir for the environment. We all know in this room that is not necessarily true. Of course, animal production really releases a lot of, 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 of gas emissions, but it's not the number one cause. That graph to me shows that there is a lot of confusion around how important this problem really is. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be doing anything about it, but there's lots of confusion. Weaponizing research. This is a major threat, and I, and I want to speak to the students in the room for a second. Okay? One study does not set an absolute. Science is not an absolute. If, you, if a study claims that margarine is bad, if a study claims that red meat is bad, this is not the end. Look at the ensemble of studies. Oceana, Canada, a group I actually used to work with as a volunteer based out of Ottawa, their goal is to preserve ocean sustainability. You may not be aware of this group, but for the last two years, they've been releasing this report about, these reports about food fraud. Uh, they didn't do a study in Winnipeg, but they covered Victoria, Vancouver, Calgary, Ottawa, Montreal, Toronto, and Halifax. And they claim that 61% of all the seafood we eat in Canada is mislabeled. So I do work in traceability. If you ask me, is there a food fraud problem in Canada? I would say absolutely. Absolutely. 61%? I don't know. Look at these results. So I actually provided to some, my, some of my group an inventory of key research studies on seafood labeling. And mislabeling rates are way below 61%. That 41% out of the U.S. looked at 15 sushi restaurants in L.A. Are they sushi restaurants in Winnipeg? Yeah. <laughs> if you like sushi, let's listen. If you go into a, a, a buffet, all you can eat sushi buffet for $10 a person. You now, ask yourself a question. Okay? That's what I'm. So, yeah, be careful what you wish for. So, food fraud is there. And. It's fixable. It's something that the CFI is working into, and I'm actually on, the, uh, on, a, on a strategic committee to help the CFI resolve this issue. But Oceana deliberately used research to send a flawed message to the public, and all we heard in the media that week was 61%. Last week, I went to a fish factory in Montreal. Sales are down 47%. And that organization is ocean-wise certified. They apply traceability systems, state-of-the-art traceability systems. They're going to have to lay off people. And this is really concerning to me. So when you think about all the information being sent all over the place, it brings different people to make bad decisions. Look at Germany looking at implementing a meat tax. It came out this summer. In the fall, over five universities, universities, public universities are now banning beef from campus. The first one was in, was in England. 
uh, the University of uh, England in London. Incredible. When you see that happening, you wonder, wow, policy is being affected by all this research that may be right or wrong, but research is not about right or wrong. It's about really seeking more knowledge. And we forgot about that. And the protein war of 2019 was galvanized by that, by that confusion as far as I'm concerned. McDonald's. Are you guys hungry? No? <laughs> I think they are, actually. Uh, McDonald's is a good example uh, of, of how a company is really hedging against what is being perceived out there. So McDonald's for the longest time has been champion of Canadian beef, Canadian agriculture really. And now it's actually running a pilot with Beyond Meat in Ontario. 29 stores, 29 restaurants are selling consumers the so-called PLT, plant, lettuce, and tomato. It's not a joke. <laughs> it's true. A brand. That's McDonald's. Come on. McDonald's is a huge network. Now, if you ask me tomorrow, will McDonald's actually sell Beyond Meat products everywhere? I can't see it because Beyond Meat is nowhere near big enough. McDonald's is a massive network. But they're trying it. They're basically looking into it in southern Ontario. And it's the only place in the world where they're trying this plant-based formula. Canada is a protein lab for McDonald's. And, but if you talk to Canada producers, they're very upset with this. It, it really goes to the core. It's, it's treason. They feel betrayed. When I was in Brandon in January, that's what I heard. When I went to uh, Regina in February, that's what I heard. When I went to Red Deer, Alberta in March in front of 700 cattle producers, most of them were wearing cowboy hats. That's what I heard. And then after me was Brad Wall, the former premier of Saskatchewan. He was speaking and he said, I'm not going to mention two letters, A-W, because I don't want to upset you. And people went nuts. You know, there was an election going on in Alberta as well, so you know, they saw him as a premier of Alberta or something. But there's a, lot of, there's a lot of, every time a food service company is making a decision around proteins, it's really kind of challenging thoughts and, 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 and paradigms. If you thought there's uh, uh, 3 million vegans in the country, that's not very true. Uh, we estimate right now at Dow that there are 466,000 vegans. They are all on Twitter. <laughs> all of them. Oh, yes. Try it out. Buy yourself a nice hamburger. Selfie, post it on Twitter. A second, maybe five seconds, you'll get a reaction. It's incredible. It works every time. Actually, this summer, I went to my favorite farmer's market, and they were selling foie gras hamburgers. I had to try one, put a selfie on, and it took, it took oh, about a minute and a half before it just, I got accused of being an animal killer and all that stuff. It's, it's incredible. Very, very vicious. But vegans, because it's World Vegan Day tomorrow, I do want to say that this is, we're going through exciting times. Okay? I don't want to be all negative here, but we are going through exciting times, especially when it comes to innovation. I was speaking to Barry's students about this earlier today. I don't think, I've been doing this for 20 years, I, don't, I can't remember the last time I saw so much change, so much disruptive forces forcing companies like Maple Leaf, like McDonald's, to really think about their business model, like to the core. It's incredible. This trifecta of meat, beef, chicken, pork, beef, chicken, pork. 
all the time. And every week, one is on special because the market wants you to buy that product versus the other. And the next week, it's the other one on special. It got boring. And all of a sudden, you see these new products coming in. Grocers don't know what to do with them. You talk to Sobeys, you talk to Loblaws, you talk to Metro, you talk to Walmart, you talk to these companies. They don't know what to do. They put it in the freezer, they put it at the meat counter, right next to the bloody stuff. It, there's lots of confusion on the supply side, but there's also this challenge coming from the marketplace. You, me, telling the food industry, you know what, for the last three, four decades, what you've been doing is no longer good enough. Because the reality, when it comes to food, and so you have all these categories, okay? You got consumer without no dietary preferences. You got with, di with the dietary, with allergies and intolerances, flexitarians, vegetarians. I mean, yeah, I can go on and on. In 10 years from now, we're going to double the number of categories. What's a flexitarian? Like, what is a flexitarian? <laughs> it's all of us, really. I'm a flexitarian today, and tomorrow I'm an omnivore. I'm a vegan the next day because I like salad. I mean, what, how does that work? We're trying to figure out nomenclature here, folks. Okay? We're just at the beginning, and that's okay. So categorizing or labeling yourself something is okay. But the constant in all this, and I really believe in this very strongly, is that we're all different. We all have different preferences. We have all different physiological needs. Our body's different. Uh, it, that's how it is. For the longest time, on the supply side, the industry just supplied to the market what they were growing, what they were producing, and just please, Mr. or Mrs. Canadian, eat what we're producing. And that's the end of it. Now. Things are turning around. Demand side economics, demand side, demand side, demand supply management. Uh, demand, demand chain management, sorry, demand chain management. Instead of supply chain management, that's another chapter in your program. Uh, reversing, understanding the market and work your way back and reorganize the Arctic architecture of the industry. That's really what is happening. Maple Leaf today, or yesterday, it's in the paper this morning, announced that it was actually dividing plant, their plant-based strategy with animal proteins. Two separate divisions. One is to support a market they own, really, and another is to support a market that it's growing. And right now, Maple Leaf is selling for about $73 million worth of plant-based products. That's going to go up to $250 eventually, and probably over a billion dollars eventually. And that's why they're building a $300 million plant in Indiana. And so all of these things happening at once is forcing companies to restructure, to redefine itself. And Michael McCain, I mean, if you were in the room, I would say this to him. He's got a lot of guts. His shareholders didn't see this a few years ago. And to convince his shareholders to invest millions of dollars into a plant-based product and hedging against animal proteins takes a lot of guts. Maple leaf. And Maple Leaf really was a Canadian company. And I do say was. 80% of sales were in Canada. So uh, that's, they were committed to the Cane market. And the other 20% were a suggestion. You know, they were just sales. But they're building a plant in Indiana. So they're looking at global markets now with plant-based proteins. Where are proteins, where are vegetable proteins grown in the world? 
right here. Last time I was actually in Winnipeg, uh, it was to um, it was to present to a group of uh, bureaucrats, industry, and it was the day when Manitoba, the Minister of Agriculture, former Minister of Agriculture, Mr. Eckler, and I had the pleasure to have breakfast with uh, Premier Pallister that morning, great guy, and they were announcing this protein advantage. And so they presented the protein invention, and, I went, and then I was asked to speak, and uh, I believe some of you were in the room that day, uh, downtown Winnipeg, and reflect on the, the protein advantage. And, and I must say one thing, and, I, and, and Bill Gruel, who's the CEO of the protein industry cl super cluster out in Regina, is a former student of mine, uh, and he knows this. I was quite impressed. With the, with the strategy that was presented uh, to Manitobans. I do believe that there's a future. I do believe that Manitoba is poised to do very well in this space. Absolutely. Uh, that was my message then, and I still believe in it. Uh, because there's so much emphasis on supply chain management as well, and I was explaining that to Barry is a student earlier. You see, in Winnipeg, nothing comes naturally when it comes to logistics. You gotta work hard at it. There's no water, markets aren't close. It's not like Montreal and Toronto. I mean, the St. Lawrence Seaway made the East lazy when it comes to logistics. It, it's there. Winnipeg is in the middle, right? In a smack middle. So when you, talk, when you think about supply chain management, you got to think about where you are and how you're going to get to that market. Absolutely. And I must salute the University of Manitoba for training students in that area because there are very few universities that do that in this country. We need expertise in that area. It's missing. And that is why Rocket is investing here, and that's why... Uh, Merit is investing in this market, and there'll probably going to be more. And that's why you need a strategy with few dollars. But that's not what you need. You need a strategy. You need a clear vision. And that's what I saw in Winnipeg a few weeks ago. But, and I'll finish on a couple of comments about this strategy. A couple of things I saw as a challenge, though, is, well, you are in Winnipeg, Okay. There are lots, there's lots of noise in Ontario. Uh, I'm, a, I'm in the Atlantic now. I used to be in Saskatchewan. And I feel your frustration of, of never being heard. Nobody pays attention to what goes on in Manitoba. Nobody paid attention to what, happened, what was happening in Saskatchewan. And frankly, no one pays attention to what's going on in Halifax and Nova Scotia. I absolutely understand it. But the story happening in Manitoba right now needs to be heard by Canadians as much as possible. No other province has figured this protein thing out as much as Manitobans. And I'm telling you now, I, tra I travel, I've actually been to all 10 provinces this year in the first six months. And I've, re I've returned twice. And I can tell you, what you have in Manitoba is unique. Take advantage of it. But it cannot be successful unless you make it known. You make it uh, broader as much as possible. Connecting with PIC in Regina and so on and so on. Other provinces. It's, it's badly needed. Leadership in that area. And as the supply chain evolves and becomes more globalized beyond the borders of Manitoba, at some point, the economy pulses in particular, and I would say animal proteins will be ready to develop new markets and get to the consumers that actually do want the product. Beyond Meat should have been a Canadian company. It should have been a Canadian company. It's based out of California. 
It buys some yellow peas from Canada, gets shipped to California, processed, and we buy it back in a package, paying $8 at Sobe's. That's not right. We should have figured that, this thing out. And what was missing, the reason why Beyond Meat is American, it's just we, we haven't given a chance to entrepreneurs in this country. And we haven't given a chance to investors to understand the nature of agribusiness. Beyond Meat's legacy is to make investing in food sexy. And in the same month at Wall Street, you had three major IPOs, Uber, Lyft, and Beyond Meat. Two of them failed miserably, and it wasn't the food people. It was Lyft, and it was Uber. And that's why more and more people are looking at food as a good place to invest. But investors also understand also understand that you have to be patient. You have to be patient. It's a lower margin business, and that's not going to change. It's a lower margin business, and to capitalize your operations, it takes time. And that's OK. Let's invest. Arlene Dickinson is running District Ventures in Calgary. Three years ago, she called me and said, Sylvain, we need mentors. We need your time. Could you fly into Calgary once in a while to help our entrepreneurs? No problem. And I've been doing this for three years. The businesses that I've seen out of there are amazing. And 90% of CEOs are women. Women. So diversifying the workforce is also generating more growth, more innovation, greater ideas. And that's great. Food diversity is needed, not just with products, but inside the system as well, as much as possible. And I think we're all realizing this right now in real time all together. Um, with, when it comes to innovation, I, I must say, I've been very disappointed the last 20 years. What we were able to figure out was Let's actually make the grocery experience as boring as possible, as predictable as possible, and let's run bread cartels for 14 years, break the law so we can squeeze the consumer. That's innovation. That was innovation then. That's what we were able to come up with. And so when the bread cartel store, you guys know about the bread cartel and $25 law blahs actually sent you. Who actually got the 25 bucks? <laughs> Wow. Did you guys know that you're entitled to $25? You don't have to show a receipt. You just apply. Uh, it was a sad moment for me because uh, I'm a believer in markets. I'm a believer in market failures. Uh, and this, these companies broke the law. Two of them actually admitted it so far. There's still an investigation. But I was asked to present in Montreal a few days after, and the topic was, well, what happened? Why did we see a bread cartel in Canada? And I was on my, I was at the kitchen table preparing a slide, and I was, I decided to put the face of the, C, of the seven CEOs of the seven companies being accused of, of this bread fixing scheme, okay? So seven white guys, okay? My daughter, my 10-year-old daughter, comes over to me and says, what are you doing, Dad? Oh, I'm preparing a presentation for tomorrow in Montreal. And she goes, is that the same man? That really hit hard. So this 10-year-old kind of said, wow, everyone thinks the same way. Everyone looks the same. It was brutally honest. And I think since then, we've come to the realization that, yeah, absolutely, we need to change our way of thinking in order to do a better job in connecting supply and demand and recognizing that demand is actually naturally, inherently heterogeneous. It is not homogeneous to the essence, to, to the core. So I'll leave it at that because I run out of time. But I do want to say this is, we're, this is exciting. 
I actually do think that we're, we're moving in the right direction. And for students who are looking at the job market, there's, I wish I was your age, to be honest. It's, it's, been, it's been great to watch. Thank you very much. So Vain has agreed to uh, answer some questions. And we've got about uh, 15 minutes or so for that. So uh, you know, the floor is open. Derek. Uh, so you said you, you thought that our plan in Manitoba on the protein strategy was hitting all the right notes. Can you clarify what you mean by that? Like, what was right? What's different than the rest of the country? Uh, so, so first of all, it looked at uh, research. I'm a researcher, so I'm biased. But it looked at research. It looked at uh, the entire supply chain, not just farm. I was actually, you know what? I was I, I, flying into Winnipeg that morning. I was expecting farming, farming, farm gate farming, you know, because uh, that's what I saw in Saskatchewan uh, when I left in 2010. Uh, and I always left disappointed. But I, that's not what I saw. I saw processing. I saw investment. I saw clear metrics about external investment investing in Manitoba. I saw a government investing fewer dollars and not buying an industry. Um, I don't know how you feel about the super cluster, but uh, I actually do think that the super cluster system, and I, we do have one in Halifax called the Ocean Frontier Institute. It's, if it's not done right, it's simply it is simply corporate welfare. And to be honest, that's what I was expecting. And that's not what I saw. It was, 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 which was very refreshing. You're, you're on, you're on the board. Sorry. Well, I was asked, but yeah. <laughs> but I, 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 I talked to Bill frequently. But I, I got the feeling that I, I was at the court for Bill too, and that the, the research isn't really his focus. It is not a part of his mandate. His mandate is to support uh, innovation, growth, and startups, and, and I get it. I was, I, I was actually on the phone with him uh, no later than uh, Tuesday, because I wrote an op-ed about PIC in Montreal, and uh, he didn't like some of the comments I had to make. So, I mean, basically, what I'm saying here, he knows. I mean, I, I'm concerned. And uh, what I told him is that you need to communicate, but you also need to get closer to Manitoba. Because I think that the strategy that came out of the government here is uh, enables growth for the industry and recognizes that the industry has to do some work too. The super cluster seems to be doing the heavy lifting on the financing with hope as a strategy. <laughs> Sorry. I'm an academic, I, yeah, I say what I think. Question here. Um, where do you see the, uh, the balance point uh, between the meat protein and the plant protein actually occur? Do you see a, a balance point between them? Or is there going to be enough, uh, enough pushback from, say, the beef and pork industry that is going to push the plants off the market? Which balance. I don't see it actually happening. If you are to recognize that markets are inherently heterogeneous, I wouldn't say that balance is the appropriate term to use. Markets are dynamic. By nature, they are dynamic. They change every day. What's right today may not be right tomorrow, and that's fantastic. The food industry has always recognized or not recognized that markets are dynamics. It's the same things being sold every day. You know, let's actually add. Omega-3s, ooh, innovation. Let's, uh, let's sell probiotics, ooh, innovation. It is innovation at a very different level. What I'm talking about is like architectural changes. And the announcement of Maple Leaf today is exactly what I think is needed because it's forcing companies to think differently. As soon as you start creating divisions with, inside a company, and giving people different jobs and different scopes, balance is really a term. What I think uh, is needed is, is adaptation, change. The beef industry has a bright future. 
as much as any other sector, but it has to play its card right. Denial and pushback aren't good strategies. And that's what I'm seeing right now. Question. So you mentioned that we missed out on the opportunity when it came to be a leader in the plant-based protein with the Beyond Meat from coming from California. Yeah. What do you think is the biggest barrier here in Canada in developing plant-based protein innovation? Because we don't see a whole lot of it. We've had it over the years, plant protein substitutes in stores for many, many years, but nothing really like this. I, 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 I don't know who you are and what your background is, but you, you're asking an absolutely very appropriate question. <laughs> uh, we're actually, we've been asked by Industry Canada to look into this. We're creating a food innovation index, uh, looking at Canada or comparing Canada with other countries around the world to answer that exact question you just asked. So if you ask me now, I would say labor's an issue, expertise access to proper equipment, technology, or the use of technology, um, access to markets, regs, especially around food safety and packaging, uh, are probably things that I'm thinking about right now, but I don't, ha I don't have any evidence. But those are hypotheses that I'm, I'm bringing into uh, the development of this Food Innovation Index. Yes? Different, different question, but in the plant-based protein world, are there as many risks to foodborne illnesses as we have in the traditional protein world? So, uh, I, I was actually looking at uh, the number of recalls and incidences of last year or so. Um, organics are a big one, but it, it goes between livestock and plants. Uh, the lettuce situation is, uh, I mean, we're talking about vegetables, but when it comes to plant-based, I don't think we've seen a recall this year, uh, unless, I, but I don't remember. So maybe you do, but I don't. The big ones this year were, were, were uh, leafy greens. Yeah. Well, lots of alerts, but only, there were, I think there were two recalls. But when it comes to food safety, uh, there are risks everywhere. So you can't really say that one is safer than the other. I think it would be on, 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 on call for, I would say, because uh, I've, been, I've been to slaughterhouses. And of course, there are disasters like XL Foods that I don't think is going to happen again, because uh, we've learned from it. Or at least based on what I've seen in the CFIA, we've learned from that. Uh, but I would say that really to suggest to Canadians that eat plant-based because it's safer for you, I, I don't think it would be the appropriate message to send given the evidence we have. Yes, a student. <laughs> Unless you were a mature student, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering, because a lot of the uh, protein conversation seems to be animal versus plant protein rather than a collaborative effort, do you see uh, the market ever moving towards kind of the two proteins more supporting each other rather than competing against each other in the market? Here's the concept. Why don't we encourage Canadians to actually, you know, cook a meatloaf with beef and lentils? How's that? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the, your word versus drives me crazy. It's one or the other. This, if this or that. And that's, been, that's ingrained in the business everywhere. If I win, you lose. That's the Canadian way of thinking in agribusiness. When you go to the U.S., it's, really, it's not just about stomach share. It's really about you know, the kinds of food you deliver to the marketplace, the quality of the food. And, and if you do increase the number of options to consumer, you do increase the likelihood to purchase. You do. And if you do, then you may actually be able to charge a little bit more for food. Food, I know there are food security issues in this country. I recognize that. We published 
Canada's Food Price Report every year. It's an important, I work with Food Banks Canada, food, but food is cheap. Food is cheap, relatively speaking. The average household in Manitoba, or at least in Canada, spends about 9% of its budget on food. But how come 35% of that budget goes to food service? Food consumed outside the home. And by 2032, it's going to be 50-50. Someone has money. You're looking for convenience. I'm looking for convenience. So more options, more convenience, more money for all. But eventually you do have, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Question. Yeah. And, and eventually, if the market values what you're doing, it will be willing to pay for it. It will value it more so than a trip to Cancun or that next day V set that you want to buy. Well, yeah, since yesterday, since I arrived in <laughs> Winnipeg. <laughs> Can you use a comment that you think that the livestock sector, maybe the livestock sector, sector in general, has a bright future? Um, and then you also commented... If it plays its card right. Right. And so that's my question, is what do you think those cards are? You mentioned dialogue versus delivery of information, and then you mentioned staying away from defensive. So can you just elaborate a bit further in terms of what you think that strategic approach should be? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if you're in the beef business uh, or you do research in beef, uh, I suppose you are familiar with the Cane Rand Table for Sustainable Beef, which, uh, was, uh, which was created in 2016. And last year I had the pleasure to keynote the uh, Beef Canada uh, Convention in London, Ontario. And uh, there were uh, probably at least 600 people and someone went to the mic and said, so, Sylvain, after two years, what do you think? Is this a good idea? You know, the Cane Round Table for Sustainable Beef, redefining beef to make it seen as more sustainable, changing farming practices and all that. And, 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 and my answer to them was absolutely. I think it was, it, was, it was a good strategy. 15 years too late. And then they went, and, and then the room went quiet for about five seconds, because everyone in the room knew that, yeah, they actually hesitated for many years before it got set up, and that was a critical time when consumers were starting to look elsewhere, were starting to see maybe there is something else than beef, maybe there is a climate crisis, maybe. Practices on farms aren't necessarily things that I want to support. The Earl's incident, the Earl's restaurant incident, to me, I, I actually I was on a panel with the CEO of Earl's, and I did say to him that to apologize was a mistake because he actually made a business decision to go with humane produced beef procured out, out of the U.S. because that's what he was hearing in his, his, in his 65 restaurants only to change his mind 48 hours later because the boycott probably was working and uh, he apologized. So I think changing his mind was a business decision, but to apologize was a, a mistake because it really gave truth to what ranchers were trying to say that game beef is the best. Of course game beef is very good, but it's the same product. It's, you're trying to supply the same thing to everyone. And we're no longer there. The market is no longer there. Sorry, you wanted to add? Well, I was just going to say, so given that the Canadian Round Table, I know the Science Advisory Committee, so I'm very happy to say that. But given that you the are? Okay. Okay. Is, uh, is now in place, what do you see the vision for the future? So you said it's too late, but it is here now. Um, but what do you see the vision for the future in terms of moving forward? So uh, I would say that um, you you gotta you, you you gotta partner you gotta partner <laughs> partnerships beyond the beef industry. Paul Scanda is right here in town in Winnipeg. Why not talk to Gordon Bacon? I I would. I said, but right now they they I I spoke to Gordon. He was he was in Winnipeg in August. He was in the room, and. 
he, he's never heard of, of, of the beef, from the beef industry because he's seen as a menace. That, if you just change that, just that one thing, then you can start looking at you know, understanding consumer psychology, understanding how you can marry different commodities together, how to uh, actually make beef uh, interesting for, for different groups. My, my wife was a vegetarian when I married her, but we ended up starting a family. We had four kids. She became anemic after our first child. All of, what, guess what she was starting? She had to start to eat meat. You know? So every now and then, you have, everyone will go through different situations where beef is absolutely relevant. You know? So that's what I would, and, and frankly, I see a lot of stubbornness. And I'm concerned about that, because beef is a good product. Another question here. So is there a chance that maybe companies like Beyond Meat may not be able to deliver in terms of, you mentioned how some of these things aren't that healthy, high sodium, fat, things like that. You have companies like Coke selling a product called Coke Life, of all things, right? So yeah. So I'm just wondering, do you think that there may be a backlash if they can't deliver on, on some of the work where they don't? I think it's happening right now already. Uh, so do you guys know how many companies in North America uh, that are in this plant-based uh, patty space right now? It's over 350. Beyond Meat is the most famous one. But like I said, Beyond Meat is starting to pay for its, uh, its strategy of comparing itself with beef. Uh, it's cornered itself. At some point, I do think that plant-based will evolve into its own uh, will evolve, will have its own taste and, and, and look and feel, and people will want to will want to actually go for plant-based, not because it's the same. Why, why would you eat plant-based if it looks like beef, beef or tastes like beef? You just eat beef. So that's, I think that's what's going to change. And the nomenclature, I don't think we're going to call it plant-based in five years from now, because again, we're going to evolve. There are differences between lentils and, and, and yellow peas and and, and, and so there, there are going to be distinctions, and the number of ingredients in these products is also going to change. You're starting to see competitors to Beyond Meat with 10 ingredients instead of 27. So going against Beyond Meat. So I, I would say Beyond Meat is, uh, has um, had the monopoly of attention, not necessarily of the market. But it's, it's, it has positioned itself as being a target, what not to do, eventually. Uh, but we owe a lot to Beyond Meat, because like I said earlier on, I mean, if you would have asked me five years ago uh, if plant-based manufacturing was scalable, I would say you're crazy. It became a $14 billion business. That's not bad. So. I don't see other, any other hands, so it's my opportunity to ask a question. Oh my God, the tough one. <laughs> no, no, very easy. Right. Maple Leaf uh, Canadian Company, last I looked at the map, Indiana was in part of Canada, and that's where they took their plant. Uh, what would it have taken to put that plant in Canada instead of being in the US? I thought we were going to ask Winnipeg. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it goes back to, uh, to your, your question. I think it was you that asked about, in, about competitiveness. Um, I can't blame Maple Leaf. Uh, I mean, I think they decided to build a plant in Indiana because of, of Canadian economics, labor costs, uh, low, 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 no emphasis on infrastructure. I think there is more emphasis here, but not necessarily elsewhere. Uh, equipment, um, regs around labeling, uh, and and uh, also around uh, around food safety, big issues there. And Indiana, of course, it, it it really is convenient for their global strategy, and I mean it's just right there. And so you yes, we will have maple leaf importing products into Canada to supply uh, Light Life or whatever brand they're going to go for. Yeah. Well, plant location is a very interesting topic, and uh, for those who can attend the conference tomorrow, you'll hear more about that. 
uh, certainly one of the things that I've been hearing, or things I've been hearing is clean water and green energy are really attractions here for locating plants in Manitoba. So that may also augur well in our future. Things we don't necessarily think of, we kind of take for granted, but they're actually very important. For this I, I think your energy strategy really is, is very attractive, absolutely attractive. It's green, uh, it's lean. The water issue also, it's great. Uh, there, there's a huge advantage, and that's why you're, you're, you're being successful in attracting some, some key processing money coming from abroad. It was just unfortunate that, that you weren't far enough, you weren't further or not in your strategy to, to keep Maple Leaf here. Well, on that uh, note, uh, I'd like everybody to join me, please, and thank you. Thank you.